Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Today's session, Strife in Paradise, the crisis in Sri Lanka, and the way forward. India's southern neighbor is in turmoil. What began as an economic crisis has rapidly grown into a mass movement for the resignation of the president, Gotabaya Rajapakshi, and his brother, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapakshi. Shortages of cooking gas, petrol, and diesel, crippling power cuts, and skyrocketing prices of staples such as rice and pulses have brought people out on the streets for weeks on end. With no immediate end to the crisis in sight, and with conditions worsening by the day, the demand for political reforms are also growing louder. What does the future hold for Sri Lanka? And what lessons can India learn from Sri Lanka's crisis? On the panel tonight, we have Sri Lanka constitutional lawyer and former Under Secretary General UN, Radhika Kumaraswamy, economist and co-founder of the Center for a Smart Future, Anushka Vijayasinha, Senior Lecturer, University of Jaffna, Ahilan Kadirgamar, Professor Emeritus, University of Colombo, Professor Jayadeva Uyangoda. This session has been put together and is moderated by Thomas Abraham, former correspondent for the Hindu in Sri Lanka. The full bios of all the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And through the session, if you have any questions, comments, or observations to share with our speakers, please feel free to share them in the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And with that, over to Thomas. Thank you so much, Lekha. Um, I'd like to spend a minute or two, really, for our audience, um, setting the scene of what has actually happened in Sri Lanka. And um, once more, I'm truly grateful for our panelists who are actually in the midst of curfew, power cuts, and a variety of, of, of other difficulties. We found the time actually to come and discuss it. I mean, they are, it's a really a stellar panel and with, um, I think we're all privileged to be able to have them um, help us understand what is happening um, in Sri Lanka. So let me just set the scene. Um, Quite frankly, and I, sp I was living in Sri Lanka, I spent the last three months in Sri Lanka before coming back to Bangalore um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and quite frankly, what we have seen unfolding in Sri Lanka over the past days, weeks and months has been mind boggling. Just think about this. One of the most dominant and powerful figures in Sri Lankan politics in this century, Mahinda Rajapaksa, two times president, two times prime minister, the strong man who led the country during the defeat of the LTT, hailed as a savior, has resigned and disappeared overnight. Two days ago, he was prime minister. Today, he is sheltering in a naval base in Trincomalee for his own safety. His brother, Kotabaya Rajapaksa, an all-powerful president, has not been seen in public or even heard of except for brief statements for weeks now. Two other Rajapaksa brothers who were in the cabinet have resigned. Um, Mind Rajapaksa's son, who was also in the government, has stepped down as well. They've all disappeared from public view. This all-powerful house of Rajapaksa has been shaken. And this was accomplished by an until recent recently largely peaceful popular movement that began a month or so ago with students, ordinary people camping outside the presidential secretariat in Colombo demanding that President Rajapaksa resign. The president still remains in power, but there's no cabinet and effectively no government. So where does Sri Lanka go from here politically, constitutionally, economically, um, remember, the country is also financially bankrupt, and it needs 
a loan or some sort of agreement with the IMF that will provide finance as well as access to international capital markets. And most important of all, how did Sri Lanka get into this position? How did all of this happen? Um, so to unravel some of these issues, um, I'm, I'm going to turn to, um, to our panelists and I'd like to begin, perhaps, um, should I begin? maybe Radhika, I'd begin with you, right? Um, how did all this happen, this extraordinary collapse? I mean, we know there were roots, um, we know there were financial problems, financial difficulties, and so on and so forth. But what exactly happened from a country in financial crisis now to a country that is, um, you know, that's almost staring in the face of anarchy? How, what happened in these last few months? So I'm going to leave the economic issues to Ahilan and Anushka because I'm not as sophisticated as them and I don't know it, but we all know that that is one of the primary reasons for this. The fact that people are living in terrible poverty uh, and that uh, they really, because of the shortages, uh, the, the rising costs of living, a very dire situation, especially we see it in Colombo uh, in the urban areas. So I think there was a lot of anger and frustration, but it just needed to be attached to a movement. And that, I think the economic uh, aspects were a part of that. But I would just like to uh, focus perhaps on the movement, because I've been studying it now. Uh, from about a year ago, uh, there were young activists who, who came to see me, uh, uh, lawyers, others, and they were all mobilizing on social media. And when I told people there's a lot, there's something going on here, there are a lot of mobilization of young people, people would just laugh it off and say, you're, you're, you're delusional. Uh, and that actually um, this is, uh, and how could anyone break down the house of Rajapaksa? And, and especially among the elites, the whole idea of strongman authoritarianism was very much in vogue. But what, what happened is, I think, over a certain incidence, um, these youth movement emerged. So it has many components, and maybe over the course of the discussion, we can discuss it, because it has a very idealistic side, that is like Occupy uh, Wall Street or uh, Scheinberg or whatever, which is to go in and express a kind of inclusive, democratic, nonviolent, ethnic harmony, everything we would want, uh, which I think electrified the nation. People came from everywhere, every class, every gender, um, every uh, ethnicity to give solidarity to them, to be with them. It was an extremely exciting moment in our history, those 30 days when it operated. But it also has a Jacobin uh, side, which we don't really know. We don't know how much is fantasy, how much of it is true, whether it's a makeup of a frightened bourgeoisie, whether it actually exists. But there is a claim that there is, within the protest movement, uh, a, a violent, uh, organized side. Um, so what happened is on May 9th, uh, when, uh, when uh, the president uh, sent his thugs, came, uh, prime minister's thugs came out and broke up uh, the, uh, the, the Gotha Gogama, which was the place just outside the presidential secretariat, which like Occupy Wall Street was the area carved out for this little enclave where all kinds of things like libraries and hospitals and platforms for music, dance, theater, that had become kind of sacred to the whole country. You know, these were their children, they were expressing themselves. People were very involved and they were just brutally destroyed. And for all people don't realize this, but over 100 were injured from that uh, area. Uh, so uh, I think then there was a backlash and vig vigilantism. And many people feel that the Jacobin side of the protest movement engaged in this vigilantism, along with local level anger and frustration, which is directed at some of the MPs and their homes. So then basically not only did Prime Minister Rajapaksa and his cabinet resign, but by, by the next morning, all the Rajapaksa properties in the South had been destroyed. 
and many of 30 mem members of cabinet, their houses had been torched. So you have this situation uh, where um, you're still looking at, you're just asking me the question how we got here, right? So this, this kind of situation led to the prime minister resigning. Uh, 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 and uh, we are now at the crossroads. We have the army now out on the streets enforcing a curfew. Uh, where it will go, I don't want to take up too much time. We can look at where we will go at another point. But this is, I think, where how we got here. Thanks very much, Radhika. So what you sketched out really is the economic crisis. Um, and that in turn, and that I think is what is extraordinary, led to this broad social movement that brought the government down. And we've seen this in other parts of the world, but it's but in South Asia, it is unusual. And so um, maybe, uh, Professor Wengod, I can turn to you and I will I'm going to get all your inputs. But at the moment, in terms of how did this happen? What was the what was the social movement? We've heard that there were students involved. We were heard, um, you know, there were middle class people involved, and so on. But how did all of this grow um, in, in, into something that was capable of forcing a powerful prime minister to resign and a a, a president to go into siege? Um, so, what, what were the components of this uh, of this movement? Well, uh, actually, uh, there is a background to this protest movement. So although it started on the 31st of March, you know, throughout uh, the last year, 2021, there have been a lot of protest movements outside Colombo City. I mean, there were farmers, peasants, protest movements. You know, you mentioned about this fertilizer policy, so the government, and there was a moment of resistance by the you know, farmers and small agricultural producers in the rural areas. Because the first is the rural society that erupted. Actually, there was also the crisis, you know, debt crisis among the, you know, rural farmers in the northern province, eastern province, north central province particularly. And there was, there were a lot of uh, struggles against, uh, you know, the government asking the government to cancel all those agrarian debt. And there was also the public sector teacher strike last year. I think it went on for three uh, three months, rather. So there has been, you know, the year of 2021 has been a year of resistance by sections of society in the rural areas, as well as the, you know, the, uh, the public sector workers uh, who are challenging the authority of the government, particularly at a time when we have a weak parliamentary opposition. And then, of course, uh, the, the crisis that was uh, generated by the pandemic was also largely, you know, uh, you know, it also largely contributed to this social unrest. So what happened, I think that we should not forget the fact that quite parallel with the economic crisis and perhaps a, as a conflict, consequence of that economic crisis, there was a social crisis in the making throughout 2020 and 2021. So that social crisis got, you know, exacerbated because of the financial crisis. And then what happened, uh, you know, before the 31st of March, when this big protest movement started, you know, in front of uh, President Rajapaksha's private residence, there were a you know, number of you know, urban areas, a small protest by urban middle class, large language speaking citizens against power cars, against the shortage of gas and cooking gas and you know, the shortage of petrol and, petrol and diesel. So what happened, you know, initially, you can say the first week of April, you could see students and the urban middle class at the forefront of this campaign. And gradually it developed, expanded itself into a, you know, if I may use a slightly outdated political language, a multi-class, you know, multi-ethnic, multi-class social moment of resistance. And they gradually, uh, you know, became, I mean, very swiftly, I think, became a moment for political economic reforms as well. So it's almost like a mass movement now. You know, initially there was little participation by the, you know, people from citizens from the northern and eastern provinces. 
and then later on they also joined this struggle and then you know the muslim you know tamil and christian catholic you know it's a multi ethnic multi religious multi cultural multi class you know mass movement so that is what is special about this and that's its uh, i suppose political strength as a social movement and it has also put forward a set of slogans that actually demand some you know substantial political reforms in sri lanka constitutional not only mere constitutional reforms but on the style of governance in the state society relations you know question of accountability and issues of political corruption like in india those days you know there's a whole you know a range of issues that are being raised in this movement that requires economic reforms uh, political reforms institutional reforms as well as uh, you know economic and gender justice as well thank you very much and i you've really sort of sketched out the the, the, the bigger um, the wider canvas against which all of this has been happening in fact listening to you it sounds as though this is actually the independence or national movement that sri lanka never had um, you know which other countries in south asia had and the real coming together of people um anushka i'm going to come to you on the economic crisis but before that i'd like to turn to ahilan and see i mean your thoughts on 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 um Professor Uyangoda's uh, analysis that this really is a national movement that is bringing together the people of the north and the east, and you're based in Jaffna University as well, so um, I'd like to get your perspective in a way that probably nothing else in this country has. Or maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but this is the sense that I get from um, um, listening to uh, what Uyan is saying. What are your thoughts on this island? Yeah. I mean, I, I won't say the entire country has come together in, in that sense, right? That there is a big question in terms of the participation of um, the northern-based Tamil, shall we say, in this struggle. It's been a bit lukewarm, and, and we have to think about why that is. Um, and it probably has to do with the kind of the continuing kind of depth of Tamil nationalism, which doesn't want to participate in some kind of a, a national social change sort of project. So that it's, it's mainly, I mean, obviously people all over the country are feeling um, the economic uh, crisis and its pressures. Um, I would argue actually people in the North and East, because they had gone through two and a half decades of war, and a kind of failed reconstruction process that they actually don't have even a little bit of that cushion to be able to um, you know, uh, have some support to address this economic crisis. So they're feeling it even more, but usually um, protests from the North because of the militarization over the decades, they are muted unless they are put forward by organized actors. And the organized actors in this case are the, the more of the Tamil nationalists and, and they are not they actually want to keep the people behind. If you read the Tamil press in the North, they don't want the people to participate. And including many of our politicians who are saying, you know, stay back and watch the fun. I mean, that's the kind of attitude, the cynical attitude coming out of sections of the Tamil political elite. So it's, it's an issue, but I think step by step, people are likely to come forward. But I want to kind of connect this to what maybe Radhika and uh, Jan said in terms of the history of protest in Sri Lanka, right? I mean, for me, this is unprecedented. Probably the last time we had protests of this order were in 1953, the Great Hartal, when a, a similar moment of a balance of payment crisis, when the government at that time, on the recommendation of the World Bank and our central bank, which you know, was created by an American. Our first central bank governor was John Exter, uh, a member of the Federal Reserve. On, on their recommendations, they raised the price of rice threefold from 25 cents a measure to 70 cents a measure in August 1953, which shut down the entire country. But again, pockets, right? By then, the upcountry Tamils had been disenfranchised. They did not participate as much. 
but the entire Western coast was shut down in a very similar moment. Our cabinet was so scared, they met on a British warship. Our prime minister resigned. So the parallels are very much there, how an economic crisis leads to this kind uh, of an uprising. So and I think that was part of the institutional memory that after that, from being 25% self-sufficient in rice, no other country has done that in the next 25 years, it sent shocks and fear into our ruling class that in the next 25 years, we went to 90% self-sufficient in rice. Two years ago, when the pandemic hit, if you asked me, I would have said, our strength is that we are self-sufficient in rice and no government dared to touch the fertilizer subsidy. So it was political suicide when Gotabaya Rajapaksa last year decided to go for a ban on fertilizers, not just remove the fertilizer subsidy. And it was quite clear that you know, this was going to bring about their defeat. But again, now when you look at the history of protests, you know, in 2009, at the end of the war, many sort of international analysts on Sri Lanka, including many of our pundits, say, well, the Rajapaksas, this is a dynasty, it's gonna be here for the next two, three decades. But you know, I was of course skeptical because if you look at Sri Lanka's history from time to time, we, you know, we were the first country in Asia to have universal suffrage. We've always thrown out regimes. We've never had a military coup that has been successful. There was an attempt. And by 2011, 12, the protests started to mount and trade union struggles, fisher folk struggles, free trade zones, zone struggles. And within five years, Rajapaksa was out after having won the war. So again, in 2019, when, when Gota came to power, you know, he tried to rule with his iron fist, clamp down fear into people. But, you know, they, did, they provided no relief. In fact, Sri Lanka had the least amount of relief for, you know, if you compare with other South Asian countries for the COVID pandemic. Only, we only spent 0.8% of our GDP in 2020. The consequence was clear. There was rising resentment, then mounting protests. By about a year ago, until then, particularly in the North, where it was militarized, there was a lot of fear about even being critical of Gotha. A year ago, when the teachers' struggle started, then the teachers' union in the North joined, the university teachers joined, the fear had gone. So, it, so these protests, even though there's a focus on golf phase green and um, you know, the, the, the new movement that's there. But for me, this was much longer in the making because without that popular resentment against the regime, they would have crushed this movement much sooner. And the pulse of the country was already headed towards throwing out the regime. And they can talk about the kind of economic dynamics that uh, unfolded, which more or less trapped the Rajapaksa regime by you know about three months ago. But um, maybe I'll come back on that later. Thank you. Could I just add one thing to these protest movements so we get a full picture, which is the extraordinary mobilization of the legal community. Uh, in Sri Lanka, which is uh, my, uh, which again began with young lawyers in the rural areas mobilizing around human rights and other issues. Uh, speaking, singular speaking, completely filing case after case, even though it was useless. But now, if anybody's arrested, 100 of them going to court, which gives uh, the judge a backbone to, to, to basically challenge the authorities and creates a safety net. So the courts are protecting the, the protesters. So I think the legal community also, I mean, I, I, I agree with Puyan uh, that there are a lot of farmers movements uh, and other, uh, other movements were there, but I think we also have to think of the professionals, especially the legal community that played a very important role. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Um, and also obviously the judiciary as an institution seems to be relatively, open and independent and so on, which is also reviving. important. 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you for. And one thing I would like to tell all of you: please feel free to um, want to keep this as free flowing as possible. This is a conversation rather than a series of lectures. And I'd like to imagine ourselves sitting around the table, perhaps. And so, please feel free to interject and uh, get your own thoughts flowing as well. Anushka, I'm going to turn to you now, um, and really looking at. Um, and this is actually you had tweeted about the support that I think the chambers of commerce which is another important, and we don't look at them as a social group, had um, in, in, or their call for the president to actually step down, which seems to reflect what businesses are, are, are thinking as well. Um, and, um, and sort of, and so beginning with that in terms of what the business community is thinking, and also moving on to what really this, this state of, of no government really, what it means in terms of, any prospect of relief, um, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, payments, uh, balance of payment support and so on and so forth from multilateral institutions. Thanks, uh, Thomas. So I, I'll take that first one on the, the private sector. And I think that tweet needs to be seen alongside a tweet from early April, where I was extremely critical of Sri Lanka's uh, business chambers for not coming out uh, firstly against the heavy-handed approach of the government uh, alongside the Mirihana incident, the first incident. Uh, and, you know, frankly, this latest, uh, latest statement by the joint chambers is, you know, no doubt a powerful one, given that several of those chambers who signed on to it uh, include members, prominent members who have been very close to the ruling party, who have benefited hugely from uh, government excesses, crony capitalism. Uh, some of those chambers have also been uh, very openly uh, Sinhala Buddhist in membership and in policy orientation. So uh, it again, similar to what uh, Dr. Radhika Kumar Swami mentioned about the extraordinary nature of, of this, and all of us, I think, realize the extraordinary shift, even among the private sector, frankly, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, especially since you know I've I've worked in some of uh, in one of those chambers, uh, it's usually you know all of walking around on eggshells. Uh, there's hardly an unequivocal call. This is the closest thing that we've got. Uh, the statement of yesterday or today. Um, now um, I think going to to, to your question about uh, the current political uh, uh, political crisis and how that's going to affect economic recovery. Um, I think uh, there are a few parts to it. One is that uh, it would have anyway been quite problematic for the, the regime of President Gotabe Rajapaksa and Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and that cabinet to be able to implement any form of economic recovery, fiscal adjustment, IMF program related reform package because it just did not have any public... Uh, uh, public legitimacy. Public legitimacy. So, so I think, I think while this while current this political uh, uh, crisis, crisis does does, um, uh, does, does kind, of kind of throw a spanner in the, in the works of immediate recovery, recovery measures, measures um, um, I, think I think hopefully the step that comes after that, you know, some form of uh, an interim government, elections presumably at some point thereafter, allowing the people to have their voice at the ballot box would be important because what they would also be voting on would be the economic recovery and adjustment pathway going forward. And I think what the current, of course, the current uh, political uh, crisis does is it, it, it does, uh, it, it could uh, affect some of these emergency uh, measures that are required, some of the emergency credit lines, etc. But particularly on the IMF talks, you know, presumably the staff level discussions, staff level negotiations, technical discussions can continue to happen uh, unaffected because it's happening at a technical level. There, of course, a small side note, there is a, a, a concern that with the dissolution of the cabinet, these ministry secretaries also stand uh, stand dissolved. They cease to uh, hold office. So, who would these organisations like the IMF and other lenders be? Uh, who would the interlocutors on the government side be? 
I think these have to be resolved because we we can't afford to let the let the economic immediate economic recovery uh, get delayed. Uh, the final point I make on on that around the politics and, and, and it's just as an economist observation, perhaps a selfish observation, is that um, I my biggest worry is that the lack of political consensus on what the economic adjustment and recovery program should look like. What are the elements of that? What do we cut in austerity measures? What do we not? Um, the lack of political consensus around that, potentially not gaining public legitimacy around that program, would certainly derail uh, this adjustment pathway. And I think that's what our international creditors, multilateral organizations, should be uh, look, looking at. Um, and I hope that as part, if, if there is some form of uh, interim administration, some form of all party government, that some, a common minimum program on the economy is agreed on. It's going to be tricky because a lot of these parties have somewhat different economic ideologies. But I think by and large, they recognize the economic policy missteps that brought us to this point, And hopefully they can agree on some broad elements in that that they can uh, agree on uh, moving forward. Uh, and part of that should certainly be, mean that uh, any uh, adjustment, particularly fiscal adjustment measures, cannot be hatched by a bunch of bureaucrats sitting in Colombo One at the Ministry of Finance. Um, it, the, the effects on the economy felt by all segments of society have been so, so difficult and challenging that I wouldn't trust uh, a bunch of government officials to come up with the right adjustment measures. Uh, and I think they would need to, uh, if there's anything that has been uh, revealed in these protests and people's, people coming out with new ideas and demands, is that necessarily the government will have to consult quickly, widely, uh, with different uh, uh, groups ranging from think tanks, civil society, professionals, um, and, uh, and so on. Anushka, and, and, and the first question that jumps to my mind, we can circle back to this later, is that ultimately the public is going to have to make enormous sacrifices and you need a government or somebody, a government that is trusted enough by the public, I mean, let alone the bureaucrats and so on at best are going to be the implementers, but really it is the political system and you need a leadership for which is able to inspire and, 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 and convince the public to make the kind of really, really difficult, uh, you know, belt tightening, uh, um, sort of uh, the, the belt tightening that is, is I think, bound to come. Um, uh, uh, frankly, Thomas, I think the belt tightening is already there. People are already yeah. making immense sacrifices. So I think any adjustment pathway forward will have to mean that the belt tightening happens in other places. For example, uh, scaling back on non-essential capital expenditure projects. Um, almost, you know, the secretary to the finance ministry should probably appoint a task force to go line by line on the budget mm -hmm. and find up places to free up fiscal space in order to provide uh, humanitarian relief, um, you know, and welfare to, to the public. So I think this idea that the next stage in the economic recovery would mean further uh, Australia, further belt tightening. Well, well, yes, because there is likely to be more tax cuts, more uh, cuts in government spending. But I think we, sh we, we shouldn't see... Uh, I, I think the narrative has to change, right? Uh, the belt tightening has already happened. People are already suffering. So any adjustment pathway forward would have to mean that uh, the most vulnerable population groups don't face further distress. And, you know, there's, there is plenty of room to cut in the budget. The Ministry of Education gets 4% of the annual budget. The Ministry of Health gets 4% of the annual budget. The Ministry of Defense gets 8% of the annual budget. Ten days from now, Sri Lanka is going to mark the anniversary of the end of the armed conflict in 2009. Why we need double our expenditure on health and education on defense befuddles me. So I think anyone who's saying that there isn't room to cut, there is a lot of recurrent expenditure that's sticky, 
I don't buy that. And I think going line by line on the budget will reveal plenty of space to cut uh, elsewhere and make sure people who are already facing difficulty don't have to uh, uh, face any further difficulty in the fiscal adjustment period. Thanks, Anushka. It's really interesting. And once more, I guess the question is, we need a political leadership that will be able to, I guess, do this. And so, Radhika, I want to come back. I think I'll begin with you. Basically, this is the next round of uh, a discussion, really, on where do we go from here, right? Because we have basic, it, it is paralysis. And even the three government secretaries who are functioning, um, there are questions about whether they should be doing anything and whether who, 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 who is ordering the curfew. Who is commanding you know, the police? Um, and all of this seems to be very, very unclear um, with this. So there, there are constitutional issues as well. And Radhika, I wonder whether I could start with you to help us to unpick this on the way forward. Because I think we're all agreed that the solution has to come within the framework of the existing constitutional and its institutions. Parliament and so on and so forth, but are they are they sort of fit for the purpose? That's a slightly provocative question. Um, well, I think I think uh, you know the president is the commander in chief, so mm. all the do with emergency and defense and all that he can do without a parliament. Mm. Except that if you declare emergency, it has to come to parliament in ten days, and they have to approve. There are those kind of legislative things, but ordering the uh, military out, etc. Uh, uh, and the def I don't know. I think the president appoints secretaries, if I'm not mistaken, in Sri Lankan constitutions, and therefore he's appointed defense finance at the moment. Um, so, so I think that has happened. Uh, it's a strange thing that a president appoints a secretary and the minister has to work with them, and it's a very bizarre uh, administrative uh, arrangement that we have in Sri Lanka. But with regard to moving forward, I think we really have two options. So. To me, it's clear, if you spend one day at these protests, or in any way, been in Sri Lanka for the last 30 days, it is not possible, especially with all their properties burned and destroyed, that Mr. Votave Rajpaksa stay. He has to go with his brother. That to me seems to be clear. Um, the thing is, does he go having appointed a prime minister who has a consensus candidate? If he doesn't appoint a prime minister, then the, the speaker becomes the acting president. Uh, uh, and then he chooses a prime minister uh, uh, until parliament's re ready to choose from among themselves someone to be president. Now, on the table in Sri Lanka is the choice that um, the uh, people are discussing a proposal uh, that is there uh, on the table, which is that um, there be, uh, the pre Prime Minister, when he resigned, said that he was re resigning because he wanted a national unity government. The leader of the opposition has said that he's willing to join an interim government if the president goes. The JVP has just announced that they will also join an interim government if the, J if the president goes. So this national unity government seems to be a possibility. Nobody is against it, including the independent group. Uh, but then the issue is who will head it? Um, and, um, is it and is it going to be just, I don't think that anybody will tolerate just another uh, SLPP head. So the proposal now that the SJB, the opposition has put forward, which is the support of the JVP as well, is that we have a prime minister uh, who steers through the, uh, the proposals of the Bar Association that has been put forward. And I mean, it has a lot of things in it, but the three basic things in that proposal is that one, that we bring back the 19th Amendment, which has independent commissions and independence of the judiciary and all defined. Uh, that we bring in a 21st Amendment that basically gets rid of the executive presidency. And the third, that we create the framework for economic negotiations with the IMF. So those three elements are there in the Bar Association proposals. And the purpose of the Prime Minister would be to steer this through government, in a national unity government with a national unity backing. The issue then comes is, should this Prime Minister 
come from, is there anybody in parliament who would get the support of all the parties in parliament? Or should we use the national lists of the parties to bring in people from outside with expertise or people everybody can agree to who would basically be a, a, a prime minister and a cabinet members to run this for the six months that uh, before general elections. In fact, what I didn't mention is that the, uh, the Bar Association uh, proposals say that within six months to a year, elections must be held. So basically, it's a caretaker government for six, mu six months is what the JVP has said that it's a a willing on to take. So this is what's on the table. The uh, formal uh, party members have agreed to meet today. I think, I don't know what happened at the meeting. But the issue is going to be as to who's going to be prime minister, even if we, they agree to these and work through these proposals, because even President Raj, uh, Prime Minister Rajapaksa had agreed to abolishing the executive president. He had agreed to that. Uh, so basically there is a consensus around the uh, Bar Association proposals but the fight will, as usual, be in our part of the world, who's going to take that to steer it through. So that is what the opposite, uh, of course, you must always know that I'm always optimist and give an optimistic point of view. But now I will say there's also in many of my friends and others a dire kind of subconscious fear, which is that, that that's that democratic option, that there will be a non-democratic option also on the table that the president does not go uh, any rules and we have what would basically be a Myanmar option. Now this Myanmar option, I think is very, is very complicated in Sri Lanka because first the people, in, especially the majority Sinhalese have a complicated relationship with their armed forces. Even at this Gota uh, site, there's constant uh, deference to them and they would, every Jai Weva would have one to, to the armed forces. So there is, there is affection for them. But whether they would then uh, lose that affection if they were used in a non-democratic way is something we have to think about. But also the rank and file of the police and the security forces, from what I gather from people in these fields, seem to have sympathy for the protesters. But I mean, after all, their families are also suffering. I mean, they, so whether they will be comfortable carrying out extremely harsh measures against the public and their communities, in fact, you know, it's not like fighting another ethnic group, you're fighting your own community, whether the rank and file will carry out that kind of Myanmar solution is not possible. But people fear it, that fear is there, that there will be a possibility of a Myanmar type because nobody can stand up to the armed forces to, 8% of the national budget. I mean, they're, they're very, very uh, uh, on to the teeth. So, so that's, uh, that's the, oh, that's, that's, those are two options. Yeah, thank you very much. Two roads lie before the country, the Myanmar option. And otherwise, if, if, if those who are the parties in parliament get their act together and, and take things forward in an interim way, well, that's one way that would do it. But, um, Leon, I want to come to you because these are the parliamentary, the options that we have, um, excellent proposals that the Bar Association has made, but you very vividly described what we are seeing today as the culmination of a whole series of social movements that have been building up for at least for the last two years, if not way further back, right? And the question is, are the kind of solutions that are on the table now, you know, in terms of the constitution, who is going to be the prime minister, um, you know, who is going to negotiate with the IMF? Is this, is this enough in a sense, not to satisfy, but to assure all these aggrieved sections of society that something is done, is being done and that, you know, the country is on the right path as far as their own interests are concerned? Or is this seen as something completely uh, sort of irrelevant almost, um, you know, by the people who, who have been protesting for months and years 
rural groups, the, you know, the teachers whom you had mentioned, but well, not so much, but a whole a lot of people whom you had mentioned. Um, is there, I think what I'm saying, is there a disconnect between the kind of solutions that people in Colombo are talking about and what is happening in, in, you know, in the deeper, in the heartland of, of, of Sri Lanka? Yeah, um, I think uh, we need to recognize that there is a huge trust deficit between uh, the, the citizens, young citizens who are protesting and the political class. I think it's, it's, a, kind of, it's a kind of a mutual mistrust, uh, but it's felt very dramatically uh, when we when one listens to the slogans of the protesters. One of the key protest slogans is that the President Rajapaksa should go, the Prime Minister should go, the Cabinet should go, and the entire Parliament, 225 members should go as well including opposition mm. uh, politicians. So that, uh, you know, lack of confidence and trust in the, you know, existing parliament, political institutions and political class. I think that's a major issue that whoever who forms the interim government in the days or weeks to come. Actually, the you know, Sri Lankan crisis has reached such a stage now, an interim government has become an immediate political necessity. Mm -hmm. so the primacy of resolving the political crisis has become so dramatic now, you know, even over the economic crisis, because the to resolve, it will take any concrete steps or even the negotiations with the, uh, the, with the IMF, you know, there has to be some kind of a political stability in Colombo. You see, the, what happened after this Monday, you know, whatever the little, you know, the credibility that this government led by the Rajapaksha family is totally shattered. Mm -hmm. So you have a government, you have a president who does not command any trust on the part of the citizens. You know, there's a huge credibility gap as well as, a, you know, legitimate crisis. You know, that is why perhaps one could observe in Colombo the last few days, you know, the public sector employees do not, you know, obey the orders of the government. The people do not obey the orders of the government. You know, it has come to that level, the political crisis. And on top of that is, the social crisis, I think we have a very, very deep rooted social crisis as well that has to be resolved in the coming months to come. And a lot of people are, or are the coming weeks, I think, you know, some steps have to be taken. And, you know, there's a kind of misunderstanding in Colombo, something like an ideology which is being spread that going to the IMF could actually resolve the economic crisis. And a lot of people don't. Uh, realize that, uh, you know, the IMF prescriptions might even worsen the social crisis. I think uh, Anushka briefly referred to, I think, the absolute importance of a, you know, sustainable social protection program. You know, otherwise what will happen is that Colombo's political elite and economic policy making elite, same economists who advise the Rajapakis as well, you know, might want to pass the burden of the economic recovery onto the poor, onto the working people, onto the farmers, peasants, and onto the middle class as well. You see, in my view, you know, Sri Lanka has gone through three waves of, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, poverty, you know, uh, exacerbation of poverty during the past two years. Uh, it's a pauperization, actually. It's a three waves of pauperization during the past two years or three years. The firstly, the poor suffered during uh, the pandemic crisis and the economic crisis is caused. And then 
the, the, low, the, the lower sections of the middle class suffered. Mm. They became paupers. And what happened in the past few months, particularly the middle class, you know, the upper layers of the middle class also became, they have fallen into poverty. You see, there's a massive three waves of pauperization in Sri Lankan society within a very short period of two to three years. You know, we are you now watching the consequences of that you know, massive process of pauperization. That is why some of the violence that were triggered the last Friday, we can even, you know, experience food drives. You know, the very poor people in urban areas and rural areas, you know, Loading, you know, it can happen. You know, Sri Lankan society is in a really deep crisis. So my worry is that the the political class, which is deeply divided, you know, in the political class, doesn't have a vision for restoring Sri Lankan society at all levels, economic, political, social governance, and policy levels. You know, I don't know whether they have the necessary vision foresight and also commitment to resolve these problems. You know, whoever who forms the, the the interim government maybe tomorrow or maybe uh, yeah. towards the end of this week will face some you know massive challenges in terms of managing the economy, managing the social unrest, managing the political crisis. Uh, you know, one one point about this uh, Burmese path. Mm. You know, my own view is that Sri Lanka's crisis is so deep. I don't think the generals would want to take over power, but they have no solutions. You know, they have no solutions. Actually, shooting, but it's not a, it's not a solution any longer in Sri Lanka. So they should realize that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure about this Burmese path, you know, option would be seriously considered in Sri Lanka. Yeah. But we can have a, you know, few months of uncertainty as well. Right. Thank you. Once more, I mean, this is a very stark picture um, and this is the stark sort of difference between what is happening in rural areas and the kind, the way this is voiced among the political classes, which is basically not there at all. And um, it occurs to me, I mean, listening to you also, it's not just the generals who are not interested, even the political leadership at parliament, I suspect, this is something nobody wants to touch. And yeah. which is why there seems to be everybody's passing the ball around, right? And seeing who drops it first. So th this is really fascinating because I think we've gone way beyond what we're seeing on the surface and reading in newspapers and watching on our television screens, really to outlining, if you want, from the tip of the iceberg, we're slowly getting the contours of the full iceberg itself. And we're seeing how big the problem is. And from what everything, actually, what all of you have said is that, I mean, an interim government is fine, but clearly you need something more qualitatively, a new kind of political leadership, new kind of leaders, um, you know, uh, a renewal, if you will. I mean, the sort of thing that we've seen in other countries where, I guess, typically in the post, uh, you know, in the immediate post-communist states where all the old leadership was swept aside, you had new leaders. Of course, many of them came back one election later, um, which is probably slightly different. So, Ahilan, I'd, I'd really like it, it to take your um, sort of, I mean, again, this is for everybody, really to take these thoughts forward in terms of building or trying to understand what it is that we are seeing in the future and probably not beyond even say an interim government and what kind of sort of root and branch changes you think are required if uh, to meet you know some of the demands that have been raised in society yeah no i think um, you know Wian has given us a lot to think about and you know in addition to what you said about a new political vision and leadership. This is, you know, we have to look at the periodization, the, the, the scale of this crisis, right? The political crisis came out of a very deep economic crisis. And not only do we have to think of a different political vision and leadership, yeah, it's time for us to think of a very different economic vision and trajectory as well. Right? And, and that's where I would kind of disagree with Anushka. It's not economic policy missteps that got us here. It was a disastrous economic trajectory going back in my view, a few decades 
that has built a very deep crisis. And it's really important to understand that if we are to understand the scale of this crisis and how we are going to move out in economic terms as well. So just give me two minutes. I want to kind of map where, because we haven't talked enough about the kind of history of this economic crisis, right? The last few months, obviously the war in Ukraine, global commodity prices, that has had a huge impact immediate, the immediate term, right? So fuel prices doubling the kind of foreign exchange necessary to get those inputs. The pandemic disrupted our tourism sector because it's really, when people are focusing on our fiscal deficit, but this is really about a balance of payments and our external sector. That's where the crunch has come, right? We can talk about the fiscal crisis in terms of solutions going forward. The pandemic disrupted uh, tourism sector, remittances, and that was you know, played into it. And the Rajapaksas did nothing to address this. They just sat on it, hoping that somehow tourism would pick up, the, you know, the financial city would bring in the revenues and so on. So you know, people are blaming the Rajapaksas and with good reason. But this is much longer than that. After the end of the war, Mind the Rajapaksa was able to show eight, 9% GDP growth in the next few years by borrowing in the international capital markets with Chinese investment, making huge investments that have not brought the returns. And we are caught in a debt crisis. If you look at uh, the, the structure of our economy, our production base, we liberalized trade. We were the first well before India, 1977, 78, to liberalize our economy. We liberalized even trade, even agriculture, right? To, to a point where our production base was very minimal. We were basically living beyond our means. And this is kind of where, what, what has led to this deep-seated economic crisis. We can go to the IMF, we can borrow from India and China, but we're just borrowing. We already have a huge debt stock. There's no vision of, so we, we can borrow, yeah, it'll give us two years. This, we went through an IMF agreement in 2016. In 2016, June was our last IMF agreement. We got 1.5 billion US dollars from the IMF. We then went in the following month, we went and borrowed 1.5 billion US dollars in the international capital markets as sovereign bonds. So that's what we've been doing. So we can do that. We need that liquidity in the short term. But how are we going to get out of this real kind of economic quagmire that we are caught in, right? And, and how are we going to move forward? What kind of direction are we going to change? Now, I want to relate this to the kind of the politics of this. If this economic crisis is going to last as long as we expect, people are talking about a six month time frame. For me, this is a five, 10 year time frame. We are like in a crisis that Greece was in. In the 2010s in Greece, they had seven different prime ministers. We are gonna see this revolving door of politics in Sri Lanka over the next decade as well. Like Uyan, I'm not as worried about the Myanmar solution. What I'm worried about is that now the Rajapaksas are going to go out. I don't think they have any future. Maybe like Marcos, you know, maybe one of them might come back two, three decades down the line, but I think they're done for for the next couple of decades. But the, when the liberals take over, the neoliberals try to tweak the policies back with this belt tightening that you're saying, the pendulum might swing back. I'm not as worried about the military. I'm more worried about a fascist comeback in the next couple of years. Because if you put, people have come out on the streets because of hardship and the kind of austerity measures that might come with an IMF agreement. It can swing to the liberals, but it can also swing next time to the kind of divisive characters that are already very deep seated in our polity. And, and that's my worry, right? That if we don't take the right direction in the next couple of years, this is going to be a long crisis. So if you're thinking that in six months, this IMF deal, they're probably going to go into this IMF deal a year down the line, two years down the line, they're going to have another IMF agreement. It's, it's going to be very, but how are we going to address the concerns of our people? And that means rethinking our economy. That means coming to terms with our elite. The, the, the income of our country has been earned by our working women women working in the plantations, women working in the uh, free trade zones, women going and working as migrant workers in the, in, the, in the Middle East. And what did we do with that? We beautified Colombo, 
We imported BMWs, Mercedes Benzes, and Lamborghinis, and you're, you're seeing that. You're seeing the response from the people. We got a glimpse of it a couple of days ago. I think we're going to see much more of it if we don't come to terms with it. I think Anushka probably wants to respond. <laughs> his Ahila, and, uh, thanks. Uh, that was wonderful for your very passionate and eloquently argued case. Anushka, I'm sure you don't agree with at least 50 to 60 percent of what Ahilan has said. And I, 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 I would like to, and basically it is, um, I would like in a sense to get from you, is there a free market, an open market solution to the deep-seated social and economic problems that uh, both Uyan and Ahilan have sketched out, and they're very real, right? Um, and there do two ways to address it. One is we have heard just now. The other would be, um, you know, unleash, you know, let the markets do their magic, and 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 um, uh, you know, and 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 sort of everybody would rise as the water rises, all the boats will be will rise with them, and so on and so forth. So, what are, where do you stand on this, and what is your response to to us, these questions that have been raised about Sri Lanka's economic future? Um, if it continues on the current sort of globalized free market uh, path. Uh, so Thomas, I don't think I'm alone in uh, saying that there's no country in the world today that thinks that uh, markets make magic uh, completely on their own. And there's no government, even the most free market uh, or supposedly free market economies in this world, in the West, do not uh, operate, uh, you know, at, at those policy extremes. Uh, and, you know, I don't see any reason why Sri Lanka should uh, should either. I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that Ahilan said. And Thomas, even though you thought I would disagree with uh, a lot of what he said, I, I, I don't. I mean, it's, it's fact that Sri I Lanka... Mean, I, I was hoping. War... <laughs> uh, sorry to disappoint, but, you know, Sri Lanka's post-war economic growth model uh, has been extremely problematic. And many economists, including myself, have been uh, flagging the issue of uh, uh, growth largely being led by public uh, debt fueled public infrastructure. And debt fueled public infrastructure in investment invested in part, not all, you know, there was connective infrastructure, right, like uh, roads and highways and bridges that were needed, but also in projects that very clearly weren't going to give us uh, the returns and uh, clearly questions around not just value for money, but also around uh, corruption. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, debate among uh, uh, particularly young people about debt, in debt being bad, you know, national debt. For me, I'm, you know, uh, I, I like to simplify it and compare it to a, to a business. If a business goes to a bank and takes on uh, a loan to buy new capital equipment and machinery to strengthen their own revenue generating prospects, if internally it has a good finance manager, a good account, accounting professional to make sure that you know, money is spent wisely, and if that business has other sources of generating revenue why, in order to pay off this loan from other parts of the business, Nothing wrong in this business taking on debt. But when this business owner takes the loan from the bank saying it's for cap productive capital equipment and machinery, but ends up buying a Rolex for himself, does not have a good finance manager and financial discipline, and does not invest in those other sources of revenue generation in order to pay off the monthly installments on the loan, that's when we get into a problem. And that's what Sri Lanka did. Sri Lanka almost stumbled into upper middle income status. We had, as former governor Indrajit Kumaraswamy likes to say, for many years, we had this never, never money. Um, we had a uh, very generous donor aid coming in. Anushka, I think we've missed you. Uh, Thomas, did you lose me there for a minute? Yeah, yeah, for a little while. Yeah. I think for about 30 seconds or so. Yeah. 
So we had, uh, you know, po- there was post tsunami uh, donor money coming in, post war donor money money coming in, and when we graduated to uh, from lower middle income to upper middle income, we almost stumbled into it. We didn't in, uh, have the institutional structures in place around fiscal discipline, monetary policy discipline, uh, discipline about how we use our debt, public finance, financial management, discipline around the budget. All of these things that are required of a country that is going into upper middle income, that is going into greater and greater international sovereign bond debt, uh, and we are at the uh, uh, we are at the mercy of international rating agencies, rightly so. So Sri Lanka kind of went into, we were almost, we, we did adult things while having, you know, reckless teenage behavior. Um, and uh, all of this has, you know, contributed to, to where we are. So I mean, in, in a sense, I agree with the several things that Ireland said about this uh, problematic post economic growth model. And uh, we neglected productive parts of our economy. Um, we neglected, like the business, not investing, not, not getting the revenues from other parts of the business. We didn't invest in uh, export sectors that uh, are, are, can bring in uh, growth. I mean, I, I've been in so many meetings with government officials uh, around the budget period where we're trying to get allocations for new initiatives around exports. You know, growing IT services, growing the nascent electronic component manufacturing industry in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, food processed food and beverage export industry. Uh, the, 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 the kind of economic model and conceptualization of what, how growth is generated had been so skewed by the first Rajapaksa regime with constructing stuff that even public officials in finance ministry and other things just couldn't get their head around uh, generating growth through you know, driving exports. And I think the 2015 uh, regime that came in 2015 tried to change that narrative, bring in a focus around trade and investment, you know, elements of more modern industrial policies, productive development policies uh, to, to generate the new drivers of growth. But of course, you know, for all the reasons we know, uh, many of those things couldn't, couldn't continue. So I think uh, now um, uh, recognizing that going to the IMF is essential as life support. Getting some of these credit lines is essential as life support. But, you know, we can't be in the ICU forever. Getting out of the ICU and then getting out of the ICU should not be reliant on these emergency credit lines or the IMF. We have to do the hard work of a recovering patient. And that is, you know, investing in our, uh, in, in our health, getting fitter. And by that, I mean, investing in the productive uh, parts of, of the economy and not assuming that, uh, and this was assumptions in the last two years, that tourism will save the day, remittances will recover, exports will just pick up and automatically the, the, the tide will turn. I think there was a lot of, over assumption, over enthusiasm that those existing sources of growth will simply take us through. Um, and I think oh, we have a much better recognition, hopefully now that uh, we need to re- in- invest in you know, productive parts of, of the economy. Add one, a couple things to what um, uh, Anushka said. Um, yeah. in, in, in- I, I, I- the benefit of our audience, I just want to give one point in terms of context um, in Sri Lanka's economic context, and that is really for the benefit of all of us here in India, is that the fact is that Sri Lanka's per capita GDP is still twice, roughly twice, if not more, what India's is. And also um, on the Human Development Index, for example, I mean, Sri Lanka still is very, very high. So I think it's useful to put this also in context. I mean, I agree with you entirely in terms of the hardships, the immiserization and so on and so forth. But this really is for our own audience as well, just to have a context of where Sri Lanka is and where India is. Um, so, yeah. so over to you, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Just I mean, briefly, um, one, the reason why we have high human development indicators in the 1970s, along with Kerala, Sri Lanka was seen, and and Cuba, Sri Lanka was seen as a model, mainly because of free education, free healthcare, and food subsidies 
from the 1950s to the 70s, right? And, and today, even though there's been privatization through the back door, even today we have free education all the way up to university education, free healthcare, the food subsidy, JR cut after liberalization, right? And so now we are facing this kind of almost, in my view, what I'm really worried about is starvation or even famine type of conditions in the next few years, which brings up the question, right? How much emphasis do we place on growth versus self-sufficiency if we are going into that kind of a food crisis, right? The next few years, I mean, eventually for a country like Sri Lanka, we need accumulation growth and so on, but the sequencing of it, where we place enough importance on the food system and food, because much of these protests are also linked to that, right? The essential goods. But the other point, just for all of you to think about, Sri Lanka is always a front line. We were the first country to liberalize, and Sri Lanka is not the only country going into this kind of balance of payment problem now. The, the, the IMF World Bank sessions that just concluded, they were mainly concerned about so many countries and the, the possibility of them defaulting, debt restructuring. So this might be a global trend. I mean, you know, a lot of the historic shifts in Sri Lanka happened along with global shifts in the 1930s with the Great Depression, the 1970s, the long downturn, and we might be going through such a shift now, and Sri Lanka might be the first that many other countries are going to face as well. So rather than think of Sri Lanka as an exception, it might be that this is gonna happen in many other countries as well, right? The, the global conditions, which are also not conducive to going back to the path that we were in 10, 12 years ago, thanks. Thank you, Ahilan. You know, um, I'm just conscious of the time as well. And also, so, you know, I, I just want to sum up at least what I have got from, uh, from this discussion and then have a quick sort of round uh, for all of you. And then we'll take some of the questions. Number one, of course, is that this crisis is far, far deeper and far more serious than what we see on the surface. It's not a question of who's going to be the next prime minister or who's going to be the next president. Right? It is far different. So what are they going to do and how are they going to respond to really the, the voices that have been coming out, um, that have been um, I mean, uh, the different social sectors, the social issues, and so on and so forth. The second thing, of course, is that, and this is something that I think Radhika brought out very well, is that something has to happen. We're not, we can't work, you know, wait for some sort of, you know, major political changes. I mean, this is also an immediate crisis. You need somebody, I mean, this is like, you know, you need somebody at the steering wheel now, right? Um, especially given the fact that your usable foreign reserves are pretty much down to zero. And, um, you know, petrol pumps are going to run, run dry, essential medicines. I mean, they're really immediate needs that need to be met really, really quickly. Um, and so we have these two deep-rooted deep problems, which I assume would take a long time to solve, plus the, need, the immediate needs to relieve um, you know, some, some of the issues that we've seen. So I, I really would, I'm, I'm going to do a rapid round, if you will, of uh, sort of putting these two thoughts to you. That's not a very good question. It's not really a question. I'm going to just throw your, ask you for your thoughts. Um, on, on the way forward, immediate and long-term. So Radhika, let me begin with you. Well, immediate, I think uh, uh, there is a, a, a growing consensus that's coming out in, on this interim government. But I think we haven't really focused on the fact that everybody realizes that, I mean, even the young ones are saying, we want general elections now, but they may focus on general elections six months, they may agree to that. Uh, but that is an opportunity to move beyond the existing parties. I mean, I think mm -hmm. like all over the world where things have happened, it comes where you can have perhaps formations come forward with new ideas and new discussions. Uh, so I think uh, it would be interesting to see whether this movement actually generates new political formations and things that may have new visions and new ideas. Uh, and uh, so I think that's an opportunity that we should just look and see 
uh, what's, what's going to happen on, on that level. Uh, uh, long term, I mean, the one issue that elephants in the room, which we haven't discussed, is, of course, the ethnic issue, uh, and uh, which is of India concern to India. Uh, and I think that is on the back burner even in Gota Gama. There's a lot of, it's a very good uh, place for, I think, nowhere before in short term have we seen such a display of Tamil culture, both Jaffna and uh, 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 Hill Country, the Tamil language being given a special place, all this. But there's no mention of devolution, or nobody wants to touch it, or nobody wants to talk about those kinds of issues. Uh, and so how those issues are going to play out after the, and there is an undercurrent of nationalism in, in Gota, Gautama, and we can't deny that. There is that, the flag, you know, everybody is with that flag. And so, and also now, and you have leading Buddhist monks like Sobita and all. So still the main elephant in the room that has mm. destroyed any consensus uh, throughout the history of Sri Lanka, even if we find a party that's going to actually uh, uh, deal with uh, the vision that we want, et cetera, will it get elected, what will happen? But I do think that we have now a generate that this Gota Gogama, et cetera, has created an active citizen. No, we have no longer anyone going to get away with bad governance and terrible, mm -hmm. terrible corruption and conspicuous consumption and all that. I think, I think now we have an active uh, citizen. And, and I think what went on and all the education that went on and all the um, social media around it will also create new values for the next generation. Uh, I, and I think, I, and I can see it even in the people we meet uh, regularly at different classes and different ethnic groups. So I think it's been a momentous time in that sense, in the long term, because I think it is a turning point away from the, uh, the horrible divisive uh, politics of the last few years. Thank you, Radhika. It's really hopeful um, in terms of the new politics this might open up. But as well, and I think you're very right, I mean, the whole ethnic issue, we just, for lack of time, I think more than anything else, we really haven't um, addressed except in passing uh, through some of Bahijan's uh, comments. Maybe another seminar some other time. Um, Anushka, can I move to you now uh, with these two sort of two broad questions, immediate and the long term? Um, in a sense, so, what could be the best immediate outcome that you could hope for? And um, I, I, I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll keep my uh, remarks to uh, just the economics. And I think the immediate outcome would be ensuring that we get the emergency uh, measures needed, the emergency credit lines, et cetera. And frankly, you know, humanitarian assistance from the international community. We have a humanitarian crisis when, uh, when there's people not able to eat more than a meal a day, uh, you know, health, nutrition, and education outcomes of uh, young, uh, young people and families are going to be permanently affected because of the current crisis and shortages coming on the back of COVID-19 as well. Um, so I think the, the best case scenario for the short term is to make sure that we broadly stay on course on the economic uh, recovery plans, that there is political, you know, a, a common minimum program around the economic recovery that political parties can agree on uh, so that it doesn't get, get derailed. In the medium term, I think I would hope that um, this, uh, that we have learned the lessons from the, the economic policy, uh, you, you know, uh, missteps to put it mildly but as Ireland said disasters of, of, of the of the past and you know get a lot more imaginative with our economic uh, policies you know this the same way that Dr. Aizuka Kumaraswamy brought on one of the missing elements which is around the ethnic question on the economic side I'm extremely concerned that this uh, economic recovery is going to be a slash and burn kind of economic recovery with regard to the environment Sri Lanka has a unique opportunity to uh, chart a new green, greener growth trajectory 
be an example to the world, uh, value natural capital in its growth model. Um, there's a lot of demand in our export markets for products that have a more sustainable supply chain. Uh, so I think that is an opportunity that I hope we won't miss and we'll not you know, rush to try and get back to, you know, people talked about the, 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 going, the risk of going back to the old normal post COVID. I think for Sri Lanka, this latest crisis also, uh, you know, a cautionary tale to not try and get back to where we were, but rather to, uh, you know, have, a, have a, a, a better growth model. In terms of kind of other issues that are not economics, but interlink with the economics, um, some of the prospects that, that I'm quite op- happy about, optimistic about, is that economic literacy is at a level now that has never been seen before. Um, it, it's so enlightening to hear from a, a tuk-tuk driver to a young student who has never studied or had an interest in economics to a farmer talking and debating about economic issues from, you know, bonds to, you know, the pro- problems with, uh, you know, the fertilizer ban, uh, agrochemicals ban. I mean, it's, it's as, as an economist who, who uh, our profession does a very bad job of, uh, of, of sharing the platform with those who are not from our profession and also don't do a good job of conveying our ideas uh, to, to those that need to hear it. So I think it's really heartening to see the extent of uh, interest around economic issues and the heightened economic literacy that is going to play in well in the next election because people are going to want to scrutinize economic policies of uh, politicians. The second is around demands for transparency and fighting corruption. Uh, as mentioned earlier as well, this is, this is certainly a good thing and um, it, it will tie into uh, better for public financial management uh, as, as well. Um, uh, but of course, there is this lingering question on whether we will seize this opportunity to do something better or whether we are kind of going to bumble along once again and we have kind of a zombie economy for a few years, um, that's certainly a a, a risk we face. And I think we can't disconnect the political trajectory um, that will pan out over the next few years from the likely economic uh, trajectory. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to... um, I'm going to try and look for some positives. There are many positives, but two things that struck me. First, Radhika, the use of the active citizenry, right? Anushka, you've talked about economic literacy, right? And both, and this among ordinary people, all of which I think bodes well for whoever come, you know, whatever choice people make in terms of their future leaders. And I think both of these are really positive things. Um, Uyan, I'm going to come to you last. Let me move, um, um, Ahilan, uh, can I sort of throw these same two very broad and perhaps slightly muddled questions at you, the short term and the long term? Yeah, I think the, in, in the short term, um, the, the hope is really the kind of process of democratization that is taking place, right? The, the certain democratic ethos that's, um, uh, that you can see in the discussions, in, in, in people grappling with the questions, there's a certain awakening. And um, because the hardship is going to uh, continue and how can we build on that is, is the question. I mean, I'm not fully agreed with Radhika in this sort of active citizenship and even this kind of democratization because it can be swum by demagogues and populists when the pendulum swings because people can be very active but with even a kind of fascist outlook right so so that's my uh concern so there's a certain politicization that is going on but at the moment it has a very strong democratic trajectory with the caveat that you know where that might go is is questionable in the longer term Mm -hmm. because i don't see the economic issues being resolved but as i mentioned if this is a historical shift a historical moment like we were in the 1930s, 40s, it was on that out of those kind of the, you know, the, the, the crisis and the ashes of the Second World War that we kind of rose up to the challenge of building a free education, a free healthcare system, and making Sri Lanka much more 
egalitarian, and whether out of this crisis, we would find our bearings again towards equality and freedom. And, and that for me would also mean that we really start thinking about redistribution, engaging with the question of class again. And um, you know, even when we're talking about taxation, you know, during an economic crisis, it's very hard to tax people. Incomes are falling, even of the middle class, even of the wealthy. So thinking about a wealth tax or redistribution, so fundamentally rethinking how we are going to uh, you know, build our economic structure. And, and I'd like to be hopeful that, you know, that a generation is going to get affected by it, but when we come out of it, that there will be something for them to hold on to for the future. Thanks. Thank you, and So from that, I mean, I'm taking away the, this image of, you know, this phoenix arising from, uh, well, I don't think we're seeing ashes around us, but whatever is happening right now, it's also a moment of great um, opportunity. Uyang, um, um, can I turn to you um, for your thoughts? And um, also given your sort of long span in Sri Lankan politics, one way or the other, you know, you've probably seen and experienced more than, um, than many and are able to put this in some sort of context. So both the short term and the long term. I think uh, in the short term, what is absolutely necessary is a political arrangement, interim or whatever, that would lay the foundations for a long-term process of redemocratization of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. That is the fundamental lessons we have to learn from the current crisis, as well as from the citizens' movement. You know, the citizens' movement in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, it embodies two very significant political moments. The moment for redemocratization, and it's also a republican moment. The Radhika used this uh, expression, active citizenry. I think for the first time in Sri Lanka, mm. you know, citizens have become active in this, in a classical, in a, in a, in a, in a reminding us of some of the American. classical notions of citizenship. You know, the citizens are active, alert, you know, they want to take the political process into their own hands. They are you know, uh, really challenging the ruling class, their representatives. Actually, Sri Lanka represents one of the textbook cases of classic of representative democracy and crisis from liberal democracy as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Sri Lanka has a kind of a very truncated, mm -hmm. you know, you know, highly narrowly centralized democracy, but still there are also, you know, practices and institutions of representative democracy. Now the citizens are demanding is that rulers from the president, the elected president to elected MPs should be directly accountable to the people. Mm -hmm. Right, citizens, the electors, elected that the every level should be accountable to the electors. So, you know, our traditional liberal constitutionalism cannot accommodate this demand. You see, that is why, you know, I have been saying for the past few weeks that even the opposition parties, some of the best constitutional thinkers in Sri Lanka, are still proposing. The abolition of the 20th Amendment and bringing back the 19th Amendment with some provisions and restoration of some form of parliamentary democracy without realizing that citizens' demands go far beyond that narrow framework of liberal constitutionalism. You know, ironically, Sri Lanka's official name is uh, uh, Democrat, so Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. We are neither democratic no Republican, <laughs> you know, and this is an opportunity actually, a historical opportunity for Sri Lanka for us to, you know, reimagine what kind of democracy we want to build in Sri Lanka. That, you know, that's where I think we have to learn from the Indian, you know, uh, constitution, at least our constitution makers, our constitution lawyers, including my dear friend Radhika, should read the constituent assembly debates in India, how very creatively they synthesize, fuse together liberal democracy from the British and American traditions 
and the republican tradition from uh, from uh, france and other you know america as well and also social congress socialism you know sri lanka needs i am not saying we need a socialist constitution but we need a strong framework of social democracy that's constitutionalized you know we need some you know the basic principles doctrine in our constitution right and liberal framework doesn't allow that kind of flexibility that's why i think the constitution maker should read at least now the constitution as a constitution assembly debates in india you know the four years of debates i think of the number of volumes but at least the major speeches so the my point is that it's an opportunity historical opportunity for sri lanka and mm-hmm. also south asia for all of us to really imagine we really conceptualize democracy that could perhaps you know bring in you know economic justice social justice gender justice and also you know the 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 the, the equality among different communities and group rights you know some version of group rights like in india we don't have a positive discrimination you know clauses in our law no in our constitution you know social crisis has to be addressed by a strong program of social reconstruction in sri lanka right that requires a kind of creative constitutional thinking so that these are the lessons we have to learn from the current crisis as well as to do justice to the one of the most innovative political practices or pol- rather political movements that has emerged in sri lanka this current citizens movement you know i you know i, I know as a uh, uh, island said there is a reluctance on the part of political parties in the north you know for the northern citizens to join with this uh, movement here in the south but in the south also political parties mainstream political parties are not only reluctant to have a dialogue with this citizen movement at the moment there are stories going around that it has been penetrated by radical socialists and you know revolutionaries you know there's a lot of campaign in this i think only two days ago the campaign started but i think this democracy movement has to be defended right for its to strengthen its potential for political social institutional reforms so in a way sri lanka is has a has a has a has a, has a you know democratic revolution you know uh, in the in, in the uh, it's it's it's, a, it's in a in a kind of a, a new historical moment that we have a democratic revolution in the making before us thank you it's very uh, listening to you i think you've already started right i mean this sounds like the preamble to a constitution itself some of the things that you said and if we string together some of your phrases i think um, we really are in the make process of constitution building thank you so much unfortunately there were questions waiting but we've run out of time in fact we're 2 minutes over so it 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 it, it so i will spend 30 seconds basically summing up and thanking you and then handing you us back to our wonderful organizer the bic um the sum up of course i mean this is really my what i am taking away one small on the one hand you know i i i'm ending this on a far more positive and hopeful note then when i began at 6:30 because the possibilities that a crisis that at first sight seems almost impossible to resolve and so terrible right the possibility is that it opens up and some of the things that you've talk, talked about you know sort of sri lanka using this really as a new model for other countries that are facing the same kind of problems a new, new forms of democracy citizen activism um a green agenda all of these issues i mean if you put all of this together and it's at least a few uh, no 1% of all these ideas if they actually take fruition in the weeks ahead i think uh, it it really would be sri lanka once more i mean you are is going to be a leader i think in in charting a new way in in this coming century so once more it's my uh, thank you so much all of you and um 
I don't think our audience is here, but I, I really know how busy all of you are, how much in demand all of you are, and also some of the physical constraints, whether it's power cuts and curfews and so on, and other demands on your time. And to have found time to do this, we re I'm really, really grateful to all of you. And um, in fact, I, Ravi will probably kill me for I wish we could have had done this live in Bangalore and you could have actually <laughs> come to the Bangalore International Center. But anyway, with that, I will hand you over to our good host at the BIC. Leka, over to you, or back to you rather. We are deeply, deeply grateful to each of our speakers for taking the time, despite what you're in the midst of. Uh, with rolling power cuts during the session even, uh, just to be part of this fantastic panel, which came together in such a short time span. Thanks, all thanks to Thomas. We could not have asked for a better group of individuals to give us a primer on understanding what really is up in Sri Lanka and giving us these distinct and critical perspectives with such lucidity, clarity, scholarship, and above all, such passion. You have given us simply a lot to think about and made us aware of all that we are not learning about. Thank you, Radhika, Professor Yuan, Ahilan, Anushka, and thanks to Thomas for the excellent moderation. And all I have to say now is good night and uh, thank you audiences for sticking on and see you all next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting us. Well, thanks so much. We'll be in touch. Bye. Bye.